Hello and welcome to the Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of the Doc Podcast. I'm really excited to bring you today's guest, Mr. John Vento. John and I go back quite a few years as he's been my CPA since 2012 and has handled the taxes for my dental practice, real estate entities, as well as other businesses I own. John and I have had many, many conversations on all things taxes and have become friends over the years as well. When we were discussing the podcast, there were so many things we wanted to cover that we felt it'd be better to actually break it up into three different episodes. The first episode today will be on general tax strategies for dentists. The second episode, which will air in October, will be a deeper dive into tax strategies for dental practice owners, including for those buying and or selling a practice. And the third episode, which will air in early November, will be on tax strategies for effective retirement planning. John is the president and CEO of Vento Tax and Wealth Management Group. He's a nationally renowned keynote speaker, professor, and financial services industry thought leader, as well as the acclaimed author of the book, Financial Independence, Getting to Point X, a comprehensive tax smart wealth management guide, which you can get on Amazon and at Barnes and Noble. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. John graduated from Pace University with a bachelor's degree in business administration in public accounting before earning his MBA in taxation from St. John's University. He's a certified public accountant and a member of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the New York State Society of Certified Public Accountants. John is also a certified financial planner and holds a Series 7 stockbroker license. John has been a registered representative with Avantax Investment Services SM and Avantax Advisory Services SM since 2001. He's one of the national broker-dealer's top advisors with assets under management in excess of $200 million. John has served as keynote speaker at various seminars and conferences throughout the United States, and he has lectured at Lutheran Medical Center, Mount Sinai Hospital, the NYU School of Dentistry, and the Greater New York Dental Meeting. His specialization as a dental practice CPA and CFP, as well as his focus on tax smart strategies to create wealth, have led to guest appearances on television shows such as New York One News, Money Matters, Fox Business News, CBSN, and Reuters TV. He's also published articles in Money Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, Forbes, U.S. News and World Report, and Financial Advisor Magazine. John's vast experience includes working with KPMG LLP, one of the big four CPA firms, where he specialized in audits of the medical and dental profession and the finance, uh, the financial service industry. John has been an adjunct professor at St. Francis College, Wagner College, and St. John's University, has been recognized as an advocate for promoting financial literacy, and has been a lecturer throughout the New York City public library system. Before we begin, I also want to say that the content of this episode is for general information only and not intended to be specific financial accounting or legal advice, nor is it directed toward any one individual or group of individuals. Please consult your own accountant and financial advisor for information regarding your specific situation. So with that being said, I'm happy to introduce Mr. John Vento. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Mike. Really, really appreciate that. And thanks for that uh, long introduction. That's uh, that, that was great. It's so, tremendous what you've accomplished. Some of it was actually, I mean, I knew you've done a lot of that, but it was actually fun for me in preparing for it to see just how many things you've you've achieved and accomplished in your career. It's pretty amazing. Yep. yep I appreciate that. I guess so. Uh, when you get to be my age, you get to uh, have a lot more positive experiences. <laughs> and in terms of uh, my specialty, our background you know, I am the president, as you said, of uh, Vento Tax and Wealth Management Group, and our focus is working with dentists across the country, uh, coming up with uh, tax planning advice. We call it tax smart advice yeah. uh, in order to minimize the amount of taxes they pay. And then ultimately, we incorporate that into the wealth management side of our business as well. So we not only give the advice, but we're able to implement the advice we give to our clients saving them tens of thousands, in many cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. 
So that is the short version of my uh, my background. <laughs> yeah, and it's true. And it's been great working with your firm over the years. And that's one thing that I will certainly say too, is, is very comprehensive, uh, the, the services that you offer and the knowledge base you have in the dental arena. And I think that's been... Um, what sets you aside clearly in in the accounting industry, uh, and then you add in your financial services component, and it really does create a nice nice balance and 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 a great firm. And uh, kudos to you for and you now have family. If you want to take a moment to talk about that, you've got family that have joined you, right? In your in your uh, practice now. Yep, exactly. I actually have uh, three children. All three are CPAs. All three are security licensed. But my oldest, uh, who's my namesake, John Vento Jr. He actually heads up the CPA side of our practice. Uh, my focus uh, is now strictly on the wealth management side. It's a great, great combination. That's great. Yeah. And I've enjoyed working with him as well. So um, it's funny when, when I'll talk to him on the phone, he, he he's not only your namesake, you guys sound so similar and have such a similar approach in a good way. I mean that it's fun. It's fun. Sometimes I'm he's talking. I'm like, oh my God, it, it sounds like his dad. Um, so yeah, you've, you've definitely uh, worn off on him in, in a positive way and, and it's great. So uh, well, thank you again for taking the time to, to do this. I know you're busy and you have a lot going on and, and not just do one episode, but three episodes here where we can break this down and, and really uh, provide some awesome information to our listeners to be able to help them. Uh, one of the things I find in the dental profession, and you know this very well, and I know that from our conversations, but dentists get all this education and science and background in how to do what we do as dentists, but there's such limited time and attention given to uh, the financial side of things. And it, it puts us at a bit of a disadvantage. And if you fall in the hands of the wrong advisor or don't get an advisor, you can really end up in, in some trouble. And, and like you said, making decisions that cost you or, or don't save you, but conversely cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and I know you've been very helpful to me over the years and um, helping to guide me to make decisions and not just in dentistry, but many dentists also, as I do, have other business endeavors and involvements. And it's been great that you not, aren't just a dental specialist in your firm, but you also know how the entire tax law works. So you're able to help, whether it's real estate or being an investor in other bigger businesses uh, to help with, out with that. So that's, uh, it's great. Again, I can't say enough about, about how much I've enjoyed as a client over the years working with you and your team. Great. So in your book, I want to talk a little bit about that before we kind of dive into the, the, the meat of the tax discussion, because um, it's going to come up again and again throughout our discussion. I want to just make sure everyone's aware of it. But you talk about point X and getting to point X. So if you could just take a moment and describe uh, what point X is and what it means to get to it. Sure. So point X is basically that point in your life where you become financially independent. Mm -hmm. And just to quote a, you know, a paragraph from my book, the way I define it there is point X is literally and fundamentally the point at which you can stop working for your money and our money starts working for us. Mm -hmm. It is the spot at which our savings and investments alone will generate enough income to support our chosen lifestyle and will allow us to continue to live the lifestyle without having to work for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. It is the place where we have achieved true financial independence. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically the meaning, the whole meaning behind the book. And the reason I wrote the book was for people to pursue those financial goals. And I've never met anybody that said to me, John, I have no interest in becoming financially independent. Mm -hmm. uh, so this really does apply, not just to dentists, but pretty much anybody that wants to excel financially so that one day they no longer have to worry about money. Great. And so for others, it basically is sometimes people call it financial freedom. You reference financial independence. It's kind of that point where you work be almost when we say a lot of times in our profession, you work because you want to work at that point, or you do what you want to do, not because you have to, to generate income for yourself or your family. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Uh, what, are the give me three things that you think a dentist could do or focus on what would be maybe through the three most important things a dentist could do to get to point x okay so uh the answer to that question is it will depend on a lot of things in my book i discuss what we call the 10 wealth management issues uh it's important to understand that those issues if you're 18 years old for example mm -hmm. 
three things you may want to focus on could be very different than if you were 81 years old. Mm -hmm. So of the 10 wealth management issues, uh, it'll be dependent on what are the most three important to you, depending on what stage of life you're in, what your particular situation is. But if we're going to generalize that statement, primarily the, the fundamental key here to becoming financially independent is number one, chapter one, is making a commitment to living within your means. Mm -hmm. If we don't yeah. do that, we cannot possibly get ahead financially. That we're going to just basically go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the other important thing here is implementing tax smart strategies. We're going to talk a lot about that today, as well as the two upcoming podcasts, because mm -hmm. there is a huge opportunity there to end up to save significantly more money and accumulate more wealth towards your goal towards financial independence. Mm -hmm. And the third, uh, which again applies to almost everyone, is planning for retirement. Mm -hmm. And the three I just mentioned represent three of the chapters covered in my book. Okay, great. Uh, and and it's a good summary to kind of give an overview. And it's nice because we're going to go into a lot of those avenues, and not just today, but in the, the following two discussions. So we'll be able to follow up on a lot of that, which which is great. And um, I can say, you know, I as far as the the delayed gratification or living within your means or however you want to term it, it is the single most important thing. Actually, one of my first motivational Mondays I did for the doc podcast platform was on the importance of delayed gratification uh, and, and how it got me to point X in my mid forties. And, and it really, when I started with nothing, absolutely nothing in uh, my early two thousands, I mean, I had, we had no assets, no anything to our name. Um, but because we lived within our means, we kept our costs low, built the practice, dumped everything we had back into the practice to build that asset. And then continued as that top line grew, we didn't keep our bottom line growing with it. We you know, had a nice lifestyle, but we incrementally increased things in a very responsible way. That margin combined with tax strategies and uh, other business endeavors uh, and investments really, as you just laid out, it works. <laughs> it, it it works. And and it's a really nice feeling when you get to that point and you're doing it because you enjoy it, not because you you have to do it. So exactly correct. One of the things today more than ever, and and um, you know, I started my practice almost 20 years ago. I, I went through a lot. I started it from scratch. I hung a shingle. I had no patience. I had really no clue on the business side initially. Um, there's a lot of expenses and, and dentists face a, a ton of pressure on the bottom line now more than ever, at least in my career. And my family's been dentists going back, you know, to the mid fifties. So I know the profession, uh, from a familial perspective as well. I can confidently say that the pressure of, of costs today is, is, is probably as intense or more intense than it's been in the profession. What are the biggest expenses that a dentist faces and how do they mitigate that or deal with that to try to keep them as low as they can? That's a great, great question. And uh, in the lectures that I've done over the years, it's probably over two decades now, I've been doing lectures on this subject to dentists. I always ask the audience, what's the number one expense in running your dental practice? Mm -hmm. And they never get the right answer because <laughs> everyone just doesn't think of it. But the answer is clearly taxes. Mm -hmm. And if you stop and think about it, and I, I'm sure many people do, uh, have gone through this experience where at the end of the year, they say, wow, my tax return says I earned 500000 Where is it? I have, nowhere, <laughs> I have no idea where it went. Well, I'll tell you where it went chances are more than half of it went in one form of tax or another. So just to give you an example, if you're in the upper tax bracket, the maximum federal tax rate is 37%. Then if you're paying uh, into social security tax, the employer and employee share of that is 15.3%, 15.6% actually. Then you have things like Medicare tax, state and local tax. Uh, like for example, a New York City resident between those taxes I just mentioned, they are losing almost 50%, actually in some cases more than 50% of every new dollar they earn goes in taxes. And right now I'm just talking about income tax. Mm -hmm. Then if you own a business, you have corporate taxes, you have payroll taxes on your employees, uh, you buy items for use in your office, you're paying sales tax, you add to dinner, you're paying a sales tax, mm -hmm. you pay real estate taxes. There's a long, long list of taxes that I'm not even going to mention here. Uh, but at the end of the day, most people are paying 
a significant portion of money is going towards paying taxes. And by the way, my favorite one of all, and I'm being sarcastic about this, of course, <laughs> is estate taxes. So let's say you follow all the rules of my book mm -hmm. and you become financially independent. And now on the date of your death, you're worth $30 million. It's kind of frightening, but based on the current tax law, after you exceed a certain threshold, let's call it 13 million, every penny after that, 40% of that ends up going to the federal government. And wow. some states have their own form of estate taxes. So the simple answer is the number one expense we all have, whether we're running a dental practice or just an employee working somewhere is taxes, taxes, and more taxes. So a question I always ask people is if you want to accumulate wealth, Without altering your lifestyle, your standard of living, the best way to do it is by implementing tax smart strategies in every aspect of your financial life. So in each of the chapters of my book, I have at the end actionable items. We call them tax smart strategies, mm -hmm. whether we're talking about uh, saving money for your education, your child's education, uh, putting money into a retirement plan. I show you the best way to do that in the most tax efficient manner. So understanding the important taxes in your wealth accumulation phase is going to be key to getting there so much quicker. And we're going to go through so many examples between today's podcast and the two future ones. You'll see definitely what I'm talking about. Now, while we're on that subject, uh, I'm just curious, Mike, uh, do you mm -hmm. work for the government by any chance? Are you a government employee? No. Okay. And every time I ask that question to my well, audience, technically about the taxes I pay, yes, but not, well, not, they're, not they're not writing. They're not my writing punch line away. <laughs> it took my punchline away. You know, every time I lecture an audience, I tell them, please raise your hand if you're a government employee. Nobody raises their hand. But here's the hard facts. The average American works all day Monday and Tuesday to pay the government, right? Mm -hmm. So we really work for the government Monday and Tuesday. And if we're lucky, I shouldn't say lucky, but if you're not an above average income earner, as most dentists are, then you're working for yourself, truly, uh, the other three days of the week. Now, if you were crazy enough to be a hardworking, successful dentist, and you're making, let's say, 400, 500, five, uh, million dollars a year or more, guess what? You're, pay you're working for the government well past lunchtime on Wednesday. So you're literally a government employee uh, based on how these tax laws are written. And what really bothers me the most, because I am really passionate about this subject, helping people, finding loopholes in the law, finding strategies that are going to help people save money. But really bothers me is when politicians get up there and say, you know what, we're not charging enough taxes. We need to collect more tax revenues. Uh, not going to get political here, of course, but I think the key here is maybe the politicians just should start spending less money mm -hmm. and keeping more money in people's pockets. So, you know, I'm passionate with this subject because I do know what the implications are of taxes on a person's bottom line. And it definitely is one of the biggest hindrances when it comes to accumulating wealth. So implementing these strategies that we're going to go over is really going to be the key for a lot of uh, dentists to be successful. Yeah, the, the, the politicians need to read your book about getting to point X and apply that to our federal government and our state governments and our municipalities because uh, they abandon all those principles. And like you said, it's not a matter of which side of the aisle is. It's just in general, there's just too much spending going on and not enough fiscal responsibility. And if you do that in your personal life, you don't get to point X as you've referenced and you don't get financial independence. And if you do it in your business, you don't get there. And why we think it would be any different for our, our government spending Um I don't know, but I agree with you. It's it just it's it's not responsible. It's not fiscally responsible. Clearly, uh, to to just be concerned about that top number and not the bottom number. Yeah, it's funny. When I first wrote my book, you may seem think this is a little crazy, but I sent a copy of my book to every politician for <laughs> nice. down in Washington <laughs> and I asked them to please read through chapter one, living within your means and setting a budget. But uh, no, I guess that went without anybody reading it in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> That's great. And I don't think it's crazy at all. It's something I would do. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> Oh, I love it. That is awesome. I didn't know that. So that that's uh, that's great. Um, very cool. Hopefully, some of them read it and and at least uh, you know maybe personally could help them out. But I agree on the bigger scale stuff. It's it's 
it doesn't uh, doesn't seem to be taking hold. Um, yeah, on the tax side of things, I, I know there's a lot of confusion and people talk about and, and laws are passed and something's called a tax credit, something's called a tax deduction. Um, and there's a lot of confusion on, number one, what those even are, tax credit A versus uh, tax or tax deduction, excuse me, A versus tax credit B. And number two, how that ends up on your bottom line making a difference in the amount of tax you pay. So could you give a little more information about the difference between those two things and then maybe an example on kind of what that means for kind of the net out after that? Right. All right. So let's define both those terms first. So tax deduction shouldn't even be called a tax deduction. What a tax deduction is, is really a reduction in the amount of income you have that you'll be taxed on. Mm -hmm. So a tax deduction reduces your taxable income. A tax credit, on the other hand, is a dollar for dollar reduction in the amount of tax you're going to pay. Okay. So for example, let's assume you have a $5,000 tax deduction and you're in a 50% marginal tax bracket, federal, state, and city. Mm -hmm. That $5,000 tax deduction will reduce your taxable income by 5,000, mm -hmm. multiply that by your marginal tax rate, mm -hmm. that'll equate to a $2,500 tax savings to you. Yep. A tax credit on the other hand, so maybe we have a $5,000 tax credit, that goes right to the bottom line. So that'll reduce your tax liability by $5,000. So the way I like to uh, look at it is if you had a choice between a tax credit and a tax deduction, uh, clearly both of them are valuable, but the one that's going to be most valuable is going to be a tax credit because it's a true dollar for dollar reduction in the amount of tax you're going to pay. Very, very valuable tools. And throughout these uh, podcasts, I'm going to give you literally dozens of examples of meaningful tax deductions as well as tax credits. Great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that because I think it is often misunderstood. Uh, by people and they don't really understand what the net out is on that. So uh, you also mentioned in the book about the ordinary and necessary test. Can you explain a little more about that? Sure. The term ordinary and necessary test wasn't created by me. That's actually the wording used in the tax law. And basically what that says is that, you know, obviously there's going to be expenses. No government agency is ever going to question uh, simply because if you have to pay rent for your office, okay. dental office, there's no question that's a tax deductible item. Got it. And there are other things that may or may not be considered absolutely necessary. Uh, so the government could challenge you depending on what you're trying to deduct through your, through your dental practice. So the other important point is that what you may interpret as ordinary and necessary to be successful in operating dental practice mm -hmm. may be slightly different uh, from my point of view, but more importantly, if you're ever faced with that IRS agent, they may have another view altogether. So the way I'd like to define this ordinary and necessary test, it's part of that gray area in the tax law where a little judgment is going to be necessary. So I'll give you a, uh, I'll give you a quick, quick example. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a client once who, uh, one of my accountants here were going through the records, they saw a $6,000 payment to a jewelry store and the client, the dentist was insisting that was a legitimate business deduction. So I got on the phone with the dentist and I said, what exactly was that payment to the jewelry store? Mm -hmm. But I said, it's vital to me in my practice that I see every patient exactly on time, every time <laughs> that is essential. So because of that, I need to buy a Rolex watch for myself so that I can be sure I have the most accurate timepiece available to me. Mm -hmm. So of course I scratched my head there a little bit first and I said, Dr. Smith or whatever his name may have been, I said, that sounds like a pretty reasonable argument, but there's no way that's gonna meet the ordinary and necessary test. Got it, okay. So that is really the gray area in the tax law. And some people try to take that to the extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, and the trick with the tax, tax law is this, never take extreme positions because that's the way you're gonna get yourself in trouble but never take a super conservative position because you're going to just be throwing away valuable tax deductions that are available to you. So that's sort of the short version of what's meant by the ordinary and necessary test. Great. Yeah, that's um, that wasn't me, by the way. I'll just tell everybody it was <laughs> in that example. Um, but um, it's so important because 
Uh, I think people are a bit naive and just we're underinformed, as I said, as dentists, we don't learn a lot about this. We don't have classes on this. Uh, we don't, unless we had a, maybe a parent who was in the financial industry or maybe a mentor who understands this side of, of the business, we don't really understand taxes. And I know for me, having you and your firm there was really helpful just to, to kind of bounce those ideas off of. And I think one of the things that I really hope everyone listening can do is, and you, you, you touched on it a little bit, the right accountant for you is one who I feel kind of shares your risk tolerance, risk strategy, and your overall approach. Some are very, very conservative. Some are very, very aggressive and some are in the middle. Um, and I think it's important that that doctors meet with different accountants, get a feel for where they are in that area. Cause you don't want an accountant who's going to be obviously reckless and be exposing you to risk. But like you said, you also don't want to be leaving a ton of money on the table if there are legal and allowable deductions that you, that you can take. So you need someone who knows the tax law understands, especially for dentistry, what tax deductions are there, and then be able to make sure it's in line with your with your comfort level. Would you would you agree with that? Absolutely, absolutely. So it's got to be a good fit on both ends. And trust me, there are plenty of clients that I've had to say farewell to because they were trying to take ridiculous positions to the point where. If they were ever audited, they could be put in jail. Mm -hmm. And clearly, no dentist wants to lose their license by taking positions that are just contrary to what the law is. So any dentist that takes that kind of risk is just looking for trouble. The key mm -hmm. here is you want to make sure you're working with a tax professional who understands the law and the parameters mm -hmm. of the law, but just simply focuses not on cheating, because that is not tax planning, that's called uh, tax fraud, cheating is mm -hmm. fraud, but wants to make sure uh, you want to make sure you're working with a tax professional who's going to give you every tax deduction and credit available to you under the law, but more importantly, allow you to put yourself in a position to make that a legitimate tax deduction. I often draw a comparison of, uh, you know, tax planning is like a chess game against the IRS. And what I mean by that is that if you don't know any of the rules and you don't have somebody coaching you to, through those rules, your chances of winning that game against the IRS are zero, just not going to happen. So having the law on your side and then putting yourself in a position and thinking not just one move at a time, but thinking two, three, four moves ahead of the, ahead of, ahead of the game, mm -hmm. that'll be the best way to set yourself up for success in legally minimizing your tax liability. Then on the other extreme, I've had clients that paid for things and 100% tax deductible, they can't find the receipt. Mm -hmm. And I say, look, Mr. Smith, Dr. Smith, don't worry about it. Don't sweat the small stuff. If you legitimately spent money on uh, expenses and operating your practice, if you don't find the receipt, let's not worry about it. When the time mm -hmm. comes, if you're audited, you can always go back to the vendor and get a copy of that receipt. So you know, even in dentistry, I'm sure you have patients that are one extreme patients on the other extreme mm -hmm. that's what what happens when we deal with the public you know my job as an advisor is to find that happy in between things and we're going to put together a strategy that makes sense not something that's going to put you on any one of those extreme sides excellent no that's well said and on that could you um you actually when you just mentioned with the receipts i see a lot of colleagues ask about that can you just take a moment and, and explain are digital receipts okay? Are paper receipts okay? Do they have to be organized chronologically? Kind of what, what if you get audited, what are sort of the, what's the best way to be prepared for that in terms of receipts? Yeah, well, as far as receipts, there's no requirement. It's got to be a paper document. So electronic receipts are fine. Okay. Uh, generally, I would say it's probably best to keep paper receipts for three years or so. Okay. Uh, in today's day of uh, technology, very few people are even getting paper receipts. We're mm -hmm. saving a lot of trees because of that. Yep. So if you don't have a paper receipt, don't worry about printing one up. As long as you have an electronic file where you're keeping all those electronic receipts, you'll okay. be fine. And in those cases where you are getting paper receipts, you could just have those scanned and then also put those into an electronic file. Uh, yep. When the IRS is ready to do an audit, you could simply send them or through your accountant, send them the appropriate electronic files. They're, they're okay. happy to the electronic files as well. Okay. That's great information. I didn't even know that. Okay, good. 
Um, that's, that's helpful because I know that's something, especially the younger generation. And like you said, if you're buying things on your phone or, I mean, a lot of times even at a restaurant now, they'll say that you, know, you get an email of the receipt or a text of the receipt. You don't even get a printed receipt. So uh, I know sometimes people worry about that, but what you're saying is as long as you have a digital copy and it's stored in a safe place so that it can be reproduced if, and when the IRS comes calling, you're okay. Right. Absolutely. And, and it's funny you should say about the younger generation. I thought I was in a paperless environment until my son started working here. And uh, he explained to me paperless means no paper at all. <laughs> yep. So uh, we, we, I thought we went through a big evolution with that. But once he came aboard, we have truly now gone, gone completely paperless. With the exception, I still like to print things up, read them, underline, and then highlight them. But that's just my, uh, my, uh, my, my bad habits, I guess. <laughs> it is hard to break. I, I came up in the uh, transition years where, I mean, I, in dental school and residency, I didn't even have email. I mean, so I was in that. There was Everything was paper. I was trained in dental school on paper charts. Residency was paper charts. It was starting digital like right after I was finishing up. Uh, so I was literally in that. In the, on the cusp of of sort of the old and the new, so I had to learn it all as I went. And I started my practice in the early two thousands, paperless, and I would scan every. You know, we got paper from everywhere, and I mean, it's a it's a challenge now. I think it's something that's kind of underappreciated. Docs who start out, I mean, you just start out with digital charts, and I'm sure in your your profession too, everything's digital. You don't think about it, but when you've lived and worked in that paper environment, uh, it's not as easy to convert and change everything over to paperless as it seems. Absolutely. Um, so if you could, I think it'd be great if you could maybe take a moment to go through some of the most common deductions that are allowable uh, to dentists that can be taken advantage of. Maybe we'll start with the deductions and then go to some credits just to uh, not only to provide examples, but actually hopefully help some of the people listening take advantage of some of the legal avenues to reduce those that that tax burden that they may not be aware of. Sure. So uh, I mentioned that. 10 wealth management issues in my book. That's chapter one through 10. Uh, the 11th chapter focuses on uh, managing your practice mm -hmm. as a dentist. So if you have a dental practice. In chapter 11, I have a page 242 to mm -hmm. 344. Yeah. On those pages, I'm going to provide the reader with a list of deductible expenses, many of which are usually overlooked. So I do have that in my book. I would encourage the readers to take a look at that. I could give you a few random deductions very often overlooked. Uh, for example, if great. you have a uh, vacation you're about to take, uh, if you incorporate that into a business trip, like attending a conference, mm -hmm. as long as you're spending uh, three out of five days, for example, you know, uh, the majority of the days on business, mm -hmm. you could transfer. Uh, change basically something that normally wouldn't be deductible into a deductible expense. Yep. Uh, little things like your safety deposit box, if you're still paying for that, if you're keeping documents related to your practice, pay for it through the practice. Things like magazines, publications, those are things you could definitely pay for through the practice okay. if you're using them in conjunction with your practice. So again, there's a long list of things we could go over, certain business gifts that you give, even though there's a limit of $25 per person. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, entertainment expense is no longer deductible. That was also under the Trump tax law changes. But what a lot of people don't realize, you could treat that as an employee benefit as long as that entertainment is primarily for the benefit of your employees. Okay. So again, I could go over literally dozens of these type of examples, but you can't really just list what they are. You have to give the whole story along with them. Mm -hmm. And that's why I would encourage the readers to read chapter 11 of my book, because I give not only uh, what those examples are, uh, but you know specifically what deductions are usually overlooked by many readers. Right. I am going to provide you with some PowerPoint slides for those that are going to able to see those so in case they don't pick up a copy of the book they can just read those slides mm -hmm. but in today's lecture along with the next two that we're going to do the next two podcasts i'm going to go over what i believe to be some of the biggest tax deductions and tax credits that are simply not being utilized simply because a dentist doesn't know about them and i i'm, I'm sorry to say very often the cpa or enrolled agent they're working with 
don't go through the trouble of asking the right questions and they're missing out on these big deductions. So mm -hmm. we're definitely going to hit on at least two or three of those topics today. Yeah, great. So if you want to go ahead and uh, want to start with some of the deductions that uh, that we, we should be knowing about. Excellent. So what I'm going to go over now is some of the most common tax deductions and tax credits that are often overlooked by dentists. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps one of the biggest ones that have come into play has to do with the SALT tax. Okay. Uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about that, uh, but just to go over it, that, uh, back when President Trump was in office, uh, some of the sweeping tax law changes he made was dramatically limiting the number of personal itemized deductions you could take on Schedule A of your personal tax return. Mm -hmm. But one of those reductions had to do with the deduction for state and local income tax. So that relates to sales tax, real estate tax, mm -hmm. as well as state and local income tax. So if a dentist had, let's say, $100,000 worth of those type of deductions, mm -hmm. he would get a tax break for it. Now that number on the personal tax return has been limited to no more than $10,000 per taxpayer. Mm -hmm. That presented a big problem to many taxpayers, uh, even more so for higher income earners because they limited one of their major tax breaks. So that's what the SALT tax is all about. Uh, so as far as the SALT tax is concerned, many Democrats, Republicans, a lot of people weren't happy with it, especially in states that were high income tax states, mm -hmm. such as New York, California. So they needed to find a way, these states, to... Um, make a difference in terms of this uh, limitation that was imposed on them. Mm -hmm. And starting in 2021, a few states came out with a strategy. Basically, it's a tax loophole to that $10,000 limitation. Okay. So what that entails is if you have your dental practice set up as a partnership, uh, typically if it's a partnership, it should be a professional limited liability company partnership. Mm -hmm. But you need to have two or more owners to be categorized as a partnership. But even if you're a one man show, uh, you could be a subchapter S corporation mm -hmm. and still be in a position to take advantage of this workaround in the uh, tax law. And what this does for you is does the following. It takes your state and local income tax that would otherwise not be deductible to you personally. And by making a special election, you can now pay those at the entity level. And what that'll do is it'll give you a tax deduction at the entity level. Okay. But in addition to that, which is amazing, you're also going to get a tax credit at the state level. Okay. Very, very powerful tool. So by implementing these rules, you're going to be able to take something that basically wasn't tax deductible, and now we're going to transform that and give you the benefit of a federal tax deduction and a state level tax credit. Okay, great. Now, as of today, uh, uh, as of today, there are 36 states uh, that basically allow this workaround. Okay. And one city, which happens to be New York City, that allows you to do that as well. Th these laws or workarounds were first implemented by a number of states back in 2021. A lot more joined in on this in 2022, and a few have actually added this as a tax break in 2023. Okay. So depending on what state your uh, viewers are from, they need to consult with their tax advisor about this workaround. And uh, the, the short version of it, it's called PTET, uh, and that stands for Pass-Through Entity Tax. Uh, if you're not taking advantage of this, you're literally throwing away tens of thousands of dollars in unnecessary taxes. Wow. So to give you a simple example, let's say you're a successful dentist and the profit on your practice this year, not counting your salary is, let's say, $900,000. Mm -hmm. uh, on that $900,000, know, let's use an even number, make the math a little simpler. Let's call it a million dollar profit. So if you have a million dollar profit in your practice, by implementing the strategy, you'll be able to pay the state and local taxes related to that profit that normally you would pay personally through personal estimated tax payments. Mm -hmm. 
Now you're not going to pay that personally. Your dental practice will pay the tax on that. Now let's assume the tax on that in your state comes to $100,000. Mm -hmm. You're going to pay that 100000 through your dental practice. Again, the partnership or S-Corp. Mm -hmm. That will reduce your federal taxable income by $100,000. Mm -hmm. That simple step, if you're in the 30% federal tax bracket, will save you on $100,000, $37,000 in taxes. But it gets even better. Not only are you going to get that $37,000 reduction in the amount of tax you're paying, mm -hmm. Uh, at the federal level, but now you're also going to get a thirty-seven thousand, not thirty-seven, a assuming you paid in a hundred thousand in state and local tax through the entity, you're going to get a hundred thousand dollar state tax credit at the state level. Wow. Tremendous opportunity here. Tax deduction at the federal level, tax credit at the personal level, as opposed to not getting either one of those at all if you're not taking advantage of this. Wow. This is perhaps one of the most powerful changes in the law that I've seen in many, many decades. And again, we got to give credit to the states for implementing this workaround. Mm -hmm. Because if the states didn't allow it, then you're not getting it. So you definitely want to look into this. If you're not taking advantage of it, definitely get on the phone after this podcast with your CPA enrolled agent mm -hmm. and ask them, are we eligible for this? Are we taking advantage of it? If the answer is no, the next question has to be, well, why are we not taking advantage of it? Mm -hmm. That's tremendous. Those are big numbers. I mean, you talk about uh, shifting a tax burden to that extent. And that's, that's huge. So. Uh, Absolutely. And you know what's even more interesting because of this change implemented by the States, uh, the way the law works now with this workaround these deductions and credits are more valuable than they were before the salt limitation came in in the first place. <laughs> so dentists will actually be much better, better off, off. That funny? than they were even before the tax restricted what they could deduct. So it, I've never seen such a, such a great loophole in the tax law. And for as long as the federal government allows it, you got to take advantage of it because they could potentially shut this down in a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, that is funny to see how that how that went from being. I remember when it when it came out, and people, you know, the states that are higher tax states were talking about just how <clears throat> negative this was and the ramifications therein. And now that it's turned into <laughs> something that could be beneficial, so it's it's important that everybody knows about that for sure. Absolutely, it's a net 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 winner if you're utilizing it, as opposed to just being a complete loser where you can't take any deduction at all. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's huge. So hopefully everyone is checking now. Could they go back if for some reason they check with their account and their account says we missed it or they didn't do it. Can, could they ever go back and try to get it for previous years? Yeah. Unfortunately with this, the answer is going to be no, mm -hmm. because you have to make, and I can't say in every state, because some States may still allow you to go back. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what it, the bottom line is you have to make an election on your state return Okay. Actually, even before you file your state return, you have to make a special election that you're going to do it this way. And then if that's approved, then you can take advantage of it. So unfortunately for most of the listeners, if they didn't take advantage of it in, 20, in 2021 or 2022, mm -hmm. uh, and if they haven't made the election yet for 2023, there's a good chance they're not going to be eligible for this until 2024. So again, they have to go back, speak to their tax advisor. And if for some reason they were entitled to it because their state allowed it and they're not taking advantage of it, well, they're going to have to make a change there real, real quick so they can start doing this going forward. So there's a deadline that they give you that you have to apply for it uh, separate from the tax, typical tax deadlines. Exactly. And it's a state by state rule because it's a state oh, okay. tax break. Mm -hmm. So some states will allow you to make the election as late as March 15th of the year. You want to get the advantage of that tax credit. Okay. So again, they have to go back, see what their specific state rule is. And then if they could qualify, they definitely need to do it. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, while on tax credits, um, talk to me about the employee retention credit. There's so much confusion. Literally, I no exaggeration, yesterday in yesterday's mail, I got another solicitation. Yeah. <laughs> saying, you know, you may qualify 
up to $260,000 ERC tax credit, call now. You may qualify for up to $26,000 per employee. You may qualify even if you took PPP money, no limit on funding. It's not a loan. It's a refundable tax credit, et cetera. So uh, we're constantly being barraged with these. Could you just take a moment and explain how the ERC credit works? Is it a real thing? What is it? And what and, and what is it? Are these solicitations correct? Can we really save twenty six thousand per employee? Uh, it'd be great. I think if you could just take a moment to kind of go through what the law says and and what it means for for a, a doctor and their, their taxes. Absolutely. So I'm going to definitely address those solicitations towards the end of this discussion. But before I do that, I want to just define what the basic rules are here. Okay. Good. So the employee retention credit was created uh, to help. Uh, dentists and other business owners to get through the hardship of COVID, especially a lot of dentists were required to be shut down uh, for a period of time. Um, others simply decided to shut down because they were concerned over COVID. So this was one of the many tax breaks available. Uh, we call them basically tax mark COVID virus relief programs. Mm. Uh, if you did not take advantage of these programs, going back to 2020 and 2021. Uh, unlike the other credit we just discussed, mm -hmm. here you, you do have an opportunity to go back and correct what you didn't take advantage of in the previous year. Okay. So I'm just bringing that up now because you asked that question and I gave you a note with the previous credit. Mm -hmm, sure. But here, there is a window of opportunity to go back and amend returns and still get this credit. Okay, yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So, uh, Basically, the law, again, it relates only to 2020 tax year and 2021 tax year. Mm -hmm. And the laws were a little different for both of those years. So in the 2020 year, the way the rules work is you were allowed to get up to a 50% credit uh, based on any quarter of employment in 2020 compared to 2019. So again, during a particular quarter of 2020, if you suffered because of the coronavirus shutdown, uh, your revenues dropped, et cetera, et cetera, you'll be able to get a tax credit. In 2020, that credit would, could represent up to 50% of the wages you paid to each of your employees. That's a big number, 50% of the wages, but that basically is uh, limited to $10,000 uh, per employee in terms of how much of their wage you could use. Okay. Uh, to word that a little differently, the maximum credit for 2020 is based on 10%, $10,000 of every employee's wage, but it has it can be no more than 50% of the wage is the lesser of the two, mm -hmm. but the maximum credit for 2020 would be $5,000 per employee. Okay. And that only applies to any one quarter. So the maximum credit for that year would be $5,000 per employee. Okay. And that is true that it, you could have received PPP money as well, that that part's true? Exactly, okay. you could. But here, here's something that, again, getting back to those solicitations, we'll talk more about that later. They're not really looking at the law in its, mm -hmm. in its fullest. What the law says is you cannot double dip. And what that means is if you use, let's say the first and second quarter, to get PPP money based mm -hmm. on payroll you paid, mm -hmm. you're not allowed to use that same payroll for uh, this credit. Okay. If you didn't use PPP money for the third or fourth quarter, then you could use uh, this payroll to get that credit. So you could get okay. both, but it can't be for the same employment tax, the employment that you paid for. Got so it. you got to make that distinction. It's all those little things in the law mm -hmm. that if you're not sharp and on top of the law, you're going to miss it. And whether you do it purposely or not, you can make a real big mistake here in, in calculating these credits. Mm -hmm. So assuming for 2020, you did qualify for this tax credit. Mm -hmm. And let's assume you got $5,000 per minute and you, you had 10 employees that qualified for this. That means you could get up to $50,000 tax credit. Again, assuming an example with 10 employees, Five times 10 gives you $50,000. This will require you to go back to your payroll company and amend your payroll reports mm -hmm. for the quarters that were involved. And then eventually when the payroll company processes that payroll, you could see a $50,000 
refund coming to your practice for that credit. And would they typically issue that as a separate check or is that something that comes off your next year taxes? Uh, typically, it's going to be a separate check that's okay. going to come to you. So okay. that money has been basically sent to our clients. Typically, it's in the form of a direct deposit right into your business account. Okay. Now, that's only step number one in this credit. So the law also says if you were entitled to a tax credit in 2020, mm -hmm. that tax credit will also result in a reduction in the tax deduction you had for that year. So again, you can't double dip. You can't mm -hmm. take the tax credit Got and it. the full deduction as well. Okay. So that means you're going to have to go back and amend, amend your return. business tax return okay. for that year, lowering the amount you pay to your employees because mm -hmm. part of that was subsidized by the government. Yep. And then the flow through to your personal return, that means you're going to have more taxable income there. So it will require an amendment to both. Mm -hmm. So the example I gave you, you're going to get a $50,000 tax credit going to your business, but there will be an increase in the income tax you're going to pay on the personal side. Yep. But net, net there, you're a net winner. Yep. And you, you should definitely take advantage of it if you qualified and didn't file a return for that in the past. Is Excuse me one second, John. Is amending a return a big deal? Just it's a kind of not necessarily just for this, but just in general. No, amending a tax return is very, very common. Okay. Uh, in a perfect world, if you don't have to amend a return, that would be ideal. You know, there is some level of scrutiny when you file an amended return. But that doesn't mean it's going to trigger an audit. Uh, generally, you want to try to get these credits and deductions in the year they apply. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go back and amend returns. Mm -hmm. But 2020, that was impossible. Everybody mm -hmm. had to amend because the law came out. Remember what COVID was like? The government came out with 100 new tax laws <laughs> yep. and nobody knew what the hell was going on. Excuse yep. my French there. And then they kept changing their mind and then the IRS kept reinterpreting it. So for 2020 in particular, yep. nobody knew what the real rule was. I'm, I'm laughing now because I'm thinking you and I spent a lot of time on this subject. I was laughing. If you saw me laughing too, I was thinking this exact same thing. Yep. Yep. I remember emails and conversations we had at midnight yep. debating on what was the right way to do this. Yep. And it was Absolutely, a work in yeah. progress. So <laughs> you know, one of the few dentists I know that actually enjoys this stuff. <laughs> That's uh, that's good in a strange kind of way. I yeah, guess. a bit of a sickness I have, but yeah. <laughs> All right. So the rules for this got even better for 2021. And the law in 2021 was as follows. You could get a tax credit. Uh, originally, it was for all four credits mm -hmm. uh, for basically four. up to 20% of wages you paid to your employees. Uh, if you were affected by a drop in revenues and things of that nature, compared to 2019. Ironically enough, even though it was supposed to apply for four quarters, mm -hmm. the government squashed it and they said afterwards, and they said, it's only gonna apply for the first three quarters. And I thought it was comical. And I, I said to myself, why would they do that after the fact? It's because nobody was applying for these tax credits because it was just too complicated. And I hate to say many CPAs and rolled agents they just ignored it. They were just mm -hmm. so busy with all these tax law changes, they ignored it. So the government actually took it away for the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. But with that said, even if though it only applies to three quarters, this tax credit basically comes out to uh, up to the uh, $10,000 of wages per employee. This credit could be up to 70% of that $10,000 you paid per employee. Mm -hmm. But now multiply that by three quarters, three quarters. Okay. it could be up to $21,000 per employee. Got it. This is huge. This is real big, big money here we're talking about. Uh, and again, if you didn't take advantage of it, you need to go back and mend those returns to get the credit. So again, just like I mentioned for 2020, you're going to have to file amended payroll reports for the first three quarters mm -hmm. if they apply. Uh, and then amend your personal and, and business tax return as well. So using this as an example, if you have $5,000 credit per employee in 2020 mm -hmm. and another uh, tax credit 
for the next year, which could be up to 21,000 for 2021. That's where they're getting the theoretically get $26,000 okay. back per employee. So using that as an example, if you had 10 employees and you qualified for the full amount, that could translate to up to $260,000 you could get back in the form of a tax credit. Very, very valuable tax credit. I think it was terrific. They implemented this to help people during COVID. The way they created the law, the way they explained the law, and the way they kept changing the law, there was a work in progress. That was a disaster. That was just another one of these governmental you know, regulation disasters. Mm -hmm. you know, the IRS is supposed to implement the law after Congress writes the law. Well, good luck trying to interpret anything Congress puts in writing, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's where all the difficulty came in. But now that the law is, the law is clear, Darius has come out with clarification and all this. If you were hesitant in taking this for the prior two years, don't be hesitant anymore. If you qualify, take it. But again, you got to make sure you're working with a CPA or enrolled agent who really knows how this law works, because you don't want to take credits and deductions that you're not entitled to, because that obviously could lead to a lot of problems for you down the road. And we'll talk about audits in a moment, but I could imagine this is going to be something that'll be probably a pretty, a pretty hot hot thing to audit in the coming years for the IRS as well, seeing as how uh, much fanfare there is over this and solicitations and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, the, uh, so just to kind of distill that down to the getting this, cause the 26,000 is what they're all going for. So that is best case scenario. Everything works out perfectly. As far as the circumstances you just laid out, that's the most available. If you take 2020, 5,000, the first three quarters of 2021, the 7,000 each quarter, you could end up at 26, but they're also, or, or I say, and you also need to take into account the fact that returns need to be amended and it's going to adjust and increase technically your top line number, your, your gross weight, um, revenue of your business because you have to, you can't double dip that because you had already deducted those expenses that you had paid those employees as deductible expenses. Now that you're getting the credit, you have to adjust for that. Is that? Uh, yeah, correct? everything you said is perfect. I just want to make one minor correction. It doesn't increase your revenue number, but it increases your- Oh, excuse me. Income. Yes. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah, Other yeah, than that- yeah. You said it like a CPA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, right. Thank you for clarifying that that point. It doesn't mean you brought in more. It just means that you didn't get to deduct as much. So thank you. Um, okay. So uh, if you could, uh, is, is there anything more on the, the ERC or is that? Uh, yeah. Well, the main thing I want to point out, and it was perfect timing because you you had gotten a solicitation mm -hmm. uh, in the mail yesterday and you, you put that up uh, earlier. So the one thing I want to be very clear about. If someone's soliciting you that you don't know uh, by TV, social media, radio, whatever you, whatever it might be, any mm -hmm. unasked for solicitation, you always have to be very, very uh, leery about uh, who you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not leave this to just some random person who's trying to talk you into doing something. Uh, you got to be very careful. And as a matter of fact, the IRS has a website talking about scams that are going on every single day. And it's funny, you said you got that solicitation. I must have gotten five of them in the mail myself. And I have a, you know, a tax and wealth management firm. <laughs> uh, I'm saying what I'm saying to you is do not rely on people you don't know to mm -hmm. do the right thing, uh, because it could lead to a lot of trouble for you down the road. Uh, so the IRS on their website, they specifically mentioned that a lot of these unsolicited uh, people coming out, reaching out to you mm -hmm. could very well be scam artists. Mm -hmm. So be very careful. They typically will do is make you think that the whole process is very simple. They could calculate it for you in no time. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. This is a complicated calculation. You have to take into consideration, as I mentioned earlier, did you get PPP money for the same uh, for the same employment? Mm -hmm. If they're not digging into the details of your records, unknowingly, you could be filing false payroll reports and claiming this credit, uh, you know, I hate to say illegally, but illegally. Mm -hmm. Some of them also charge huge upfront fees. You got to be very careful. A lot of them will charge you a percentage 
of what you get back in the form of a credit. That in and of itself, in my opinion, is unethical. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen some of these solicitors charge anywhere from 25 to 35 percent of the amount of credit that they were getting back from people. Uh, number one, that that is just wrong, right? And they shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a dentist who doesn't know any better and is just saying, you know what, you're going to get me back $50,000 mm -hmm. if I have to share right. 25, 35% of it with you. I'm more than happy to do that if you can make it happen. The problem is that those solicitors, their bottom line is, especially in a commission-based fee arrangement like that, they're going to do whatever they have to do, no matter what risk they're taking to mm -hmm. maximize your credit, sure. whether it's legitimate or not. And that's where you could run into a lot of trouble. Okay. So And not even know it. <laughs> what's that? And not even know it. And the, yeah, the, exactly. have right. no idea. So this is right now one of the hottest topics uh, on the IRS website. They're zeroing in on all these false claims and actively pursuing them. So many, many dentists don't realize that it's not just a matter of having to pay the credit back if it was calculated incorrectly. There will also be interest and penalty charges for doing it incorrectly. Uh, in addition to that, if they could prove you knowingly did this incorrectly, mm -hmm. there could be criminal charges and you'll lose your dental license and livelihood. Wow. So, you know, I can't overemphasize when it comes to tax deductions and credits, I'm all for taking everyone available to you within the parameters of the law. These solicitors are just looking to gain a quick buck from you. And also just think about this for a minute. Let's say you got a $260,000 tax credit mm -hmm. and you show that 35% of that to the solicitor, you paid him $91,000 for that. Good luck trying to get that money back if you're mm -hmm. audited and it's all disallowed. Mm -hmm. So just be very careful. Uh, I would only work with a CPA or enrolled agent, preferably the one that is working with the dental practice now. Mm -hmm. If they don't seem knowledgeable in it, then ask them to advise someone they, that they know that specializes in this area. And again, make sure you're not paying them a percentage of the tax credit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it'd be a great business if uh, every CPA could charge a client a percentage of their refund every year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't it's know about you. But <laughs> I don't know about you, but that sounds a little unethical to mm -hmm. me. So I would never practice my uh, my business in that fashion. Yeah, uh, that I I agree, and that's great advice. I really appreciate you taking the time to lay that out because. Um, Again, as you know, busy dentists in their practice, they see this, they they th think exactly what you said. You said it perfectly. They say, well, geez, you know, even if it's 30% of 50 grand, it's it's still money I never had before. Uh, you know, it's $35,000 or whatever it is that I didn't have in my pocket, I'll take it. And and not understanding the the legal, not just the tax ramifications of that, but the legal ramifications of that um, is, is really important. So, and I'll put a link to that um, IRS website up in the show notes as well with the link to the um, uh, ERC page so that people can can link on that and get some more information. Great. We've been talking about audits a little bit and risk of audits. I think that's probably the thing that's on the top of most people's lists of what they're most nervous about um, and probably what leads to a lot of people maybe overpaying their taxes or minimizing the deductions that they take advantage of uh, because of the fact that they're scared of an audit. So what are the, can you give me some statistics on the risk of a dentist being audited by the IRS? Um, and do you see that risk changing? I know there's a lot of things going on now in discussions in the news with the Inflation Reduction Act passed by the Biden administration, uh, if that's going to change our risk of being audited, bringing in additional IRS agents and so forth. So if you could just take a minute and just kind of speak to the risks of an audit prior and because that's obviously the only data we have to go off of and what anticipated uh, risks we have going forward. Absolutely. So the, the IRS publishes statistics on audits based on prior audits they did. Unfortunately, they only uh, produce that every five years or so. Mm -hmm. So we could go back to 2017 uh, where the IRS produced a report in 2018 of the percentage uh, likelihood of you being audited based on different criteria. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, if you're an individual 
and your income is over a million dollars a year, your odds of an audit are 3.2%. So generally speaking, three out of 100 people will be audited just simply because their income is over a million dollars. If you're an individual dentist and your income is between 200,000 and a million, your odds of audit are only 0.6. So a little more than half of 1%. Okay, 0.6, 0.6? 0.6, exactly. And then the other big thing to point out, if you're a sole proprietorship Mm -hmm. or a single member LLC, and that means you report all of your income, not on a separate tax return, but on your personal tax return mm-hmm. on Schedule C, uh, your odds of an audit between the income level of 200,000 and a million is 1.4%. So you're more likely to be audited if you file a Schedule C at that income level mm-hmm. than if you were just an individual W-2 employee. Okay. Now, in addition to that, and the... This is part of the uh, whole idea behind what type of entity should you set up for your practice. A lot of that should also, a lot of that decision-making should revolve around, you know, the audit risk, the likelihood of an audit. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is if you're set up as a partnership, PLLC, uh, again, two or more owners, or a subchapter S corporation, you're considered a flow-through entity. By the way, those flow through entities are also the ones that are entitled to uh, that flow through tax credit uh, related to the salt tax. Okay. So the percentage of audits, if you file as a partnership, PLLC, or subchapter S corporation, is 0.2%. Hmm. That means your odds of an audit by having a legal entity like that comes down to about two out of a thousand is your audit risk Mm -hmm. as opposed to three out of a hundred. So need to think that out, think that through as part of your decision-making process as well. Mm -hmm. What type of legal entity is best for you? And there are cases where you still want to be a Schedule C filer, but we'll leave that for the other lecture that we're going to go through related Mm -hmm. to dental practice acquisition and sales strategies, tax smart strategies. Great. The takeaway from what I'm saying now is that filing as a Schedule C file filer sole proprietor versus filing as an S corp or a partnership, your odds of an audit are seven times more likely if you're a Schedule C filer. We normally encourage dental practice owners to only be a Schedule C filer in their earlier years of the practice because of other tax deductions available to them. Uh, after that, almost in every case, we're recommending a partnership, PLLC, or a subchapter S. So knowing that you could dramatically reduce your audit risk is a good reason to create one of these business entities. So that, I think, is a very important factor in deciding your entity choice, but it also gives you a little perspective on your risk of audit and what categories are more likely to be audited. So you're talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. Before, by- okay, if I can ask you one thing on that before we go to the sure. Inflation Reduction Act, what is it? Is it hard to change from a C corp to a different entity uh, to make that change? Is that a challenging thing to go through? No, it's actually very, very easy. Okay. So if you're already a sole proprietorship, then that means you're not a separate legal entity, and that presents a whole list of other issues, which we'll cover in a future podcast. But in that case, you want to become a corporation and then make a sub S selection. Okay. If you're currently a C corporation, which mm-hmm. means you never made the sub S selection, mm-hmm. uh, all you have to do is file that election with the IRS mm-hmm. uh, by March 15th of the year you want to make that election effective for. Okay. So again, we'll cover that more in one of the upcoming podcasts. Okay. Great. Thank you. So then, sorry, go ahead with the um, inflation reduction. Act. Sure. All right. So one of your questions was, do I expect that the Inflation Reduction Act is going to end up causing more audits for dentists? Mm-hmm. And the simple answer to that is why yes. Yes, it will. There's no doubt in my mind it's going to happen. So President Biden signed this into law on August 16th of 2022. Uh, it's kind of ironic that he called it the Inflation Reduction Act. My personal opinion, it's really should be called the Inflation Acceleration Act. 
<laughs> because it basically involves a tremendous amount of government spending. Uh -huh. And I don't see how that translates into a reduction of inflation. But that's another story for another day. Mm -hmm. So what this act did, it set aside $80 billion that they're going to be able to spend over a 10-year period. This translates to six times the budget they had before, six times more. This is going to definitely create more big government. Uh, if you're not a believer in high taxes and big government, this was not a tax bill that I think any of us would be fan of. And truthfully, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, I don't think anybody likes the idea of being subject to more extensive IRS audits. Mm -hmm. So the plan right now with the IRS is that they're going to hire a, a, literally an army because it's going to be 87,000 new agents are going to be hired during this period. Of that $80 billion that they were given, mm -hmm. uh, $46 billion of that is going to go strictly to increase enforcement, mm -hmm. targeting high income earners, including dentists and dental practice owners. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely something that we should all be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Now, I previously told you that if you have a subchapter S or a partnership with your flow through entities, mm -hmm. that is the entity of choice. But also from an audit point of view, your risk of audit are, is dramatically lower. Mm -hmm. The IRS finally woke up to this. So one of the things they're going to be doing is increasing scrutiny for both S corporations and partnerships. We don't know what the statistics are going to be like, but I believe that the audit rate will still be dramatically lower mm -hmm. if you are one of those entities. So I would still encourage the listeners to create one of those entities if it is appropriate for them. And ultimately that decision should be made between their consultation with their attorney, as well as their tax advisor. Because again, I can't tell you what's the right entity choice for you, because mm -hmm. it depends. It depends on a lot of different factors. So you definitely should consult with their tax advisor on that. Now, speaking about the audit risk and everything I just talked to you about, mm -hmm. Uh, on my website, uh, I'll also have, I also have a section there called Tax Tips for Dentists. So every month we create two newsletters. Uh, and trust me, it takes a lot of time to create those newsletters, mm -hmm. but I make them very relevant to what's going on today for dentists. One of them is literally written for dental practice owners. We call it the Tax, tax Tip of the Month for Dental Practices. And then another one is tax smart investment strategies. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage readers to go to my website. I provide you a link to that website. Uh, yep, I'll, I'll give put that in the show notes. Yep. Great. So I'll just give you a quick link to this particular uh, part of the website. Okay. So it would be www.vento, V E N T O, tax and wealth dot com. And basically, you'll be able to see the newsletter there, along with many other newsletters I've produced on ver various tax-saving tips. So uh, hopefully, some of your listeners will uh, tune into that, and that would be uh, terrific. Yeah, your website's got some great resources. The newsletter, the tax calculator, I can put a link to a few of those in the show notes because it really it's well done and not just there for kind of window dressing, but, but has some really great information and um utilities for people to dig a little deeper into this to educate themselves more on it. So um, that's, that's great. Absolutely. And, and even one of my calculators there, we, you know, my book is based on attaining financial independence. So I have a calculator that will calculate your point X as well. Oh, cool. And that takes into consideration 12 different variables in the financial planning process. So you know, I would encourage the readers not just to read the tax savings tips that I provide mm -hmm. and also using a lot of the calculators that I've created because that will be, you know, great resource for, for anybody. Yeah, I agree. They're, they're outstanding. Um, if we get that call of an audit or a notification or however it comes, what do you recommend that, that a dentist do? What, what steps should they take? Okay. So there, you know, audit comes in a lot of different uh, fashions. So there's what's called the correspondence letter, those are the most frequent. You get mm -hmm. letters from the IRS saying that something you reported didn't match up what was reported with to them. Okay. So the way you're going to treat that is going to be differently. Then there's correspondence audits where they basically are focusing just on one or two line items on your tax return. 
Then there's what's called the office interview, where you have to go down to the IRS office, meet mm-hmm. with them in person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the most intrusive one of all is called the field audit. That's when the IRS uh, notifies you that they're coming down and they're going to go visit your office. That's the one you got to be most concerned about. Okay. Uh, they typically do that if they have reason to believe maybe you're not doing something correctly. So depending on the type of audit, you're going to want to <laughs> respond to that or deal with that a little differently. Mm-hmm. But a few basic takeaways, regardless of any type of audit, regardless of what type of audit it is, number one, what you want to do is don't panic. You know, If mm-hmm. you panic, that's not going to do anybody any good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Perhaps the single most important thing is do not represent yourself in an audit. Mm -hmm. Uh, You want to make sure you have a qualified, experienced CPA or enrolled agent that has years of experience working with the IRS on these Mm -hmm. audits, because there are questions that they could ask and there's questions they shouldn't be asking. But more importantly, you don't want to be the one answering those questions because you you might say something incorrectly and then lead them down another path that could could present problems where otherwise there might not have been a problem there. Mm-hmm. Then your tax advisor should be the one that responds to the IRS notice. Uh, your tax advisor should get a power of attorney signed from you that allows you to represent them throughout that whole audit. Uh, you want to avoid direct communication with the government, especially an IRS auditor, and having that go between the CPA and enrolled agent will make a very, very big difference. Mm -hmm. Then lastly, and again, this is just general rules. If the IRS asks you 10 specific questions or asks for 10 specific documents, only give them those 10 documents. Don't (laughs) give them 20 or 30 Uh because that would lead them down another road. Mm -hmm. So it's important that you work with an experienced uh, tax advisor who's been through this many, many times uh, you, you definitely don't want a lawyer representing you in a murder case if it's the first time they had a, a murder case to, mm-hmm. uh, to present to a jury. Uh, you definitely don't want to work with a tax advisor who's never represented someone in, in front of the IRS as well. Mm-hmm. So those are just the basic rules. But depending on the type of audit we're talking about, there could be some variation to that as well. Okay, awesome. That's, that's really helpful. I appreciate it. That and I'm sure our listeners were as well, because it's something again we don't know anything about in in what we do. And I think a lot of people get caught off guard when they do get that notification and they panic and and make decisions that can make the problem a lot worse, or maybe even it's not a problem necessarily, just a challenge, and it makes it a problem uh, because of the, the steps they take. I'd like to make just one more point on, on that topic. Yeah, sure. You know, if somebody says CIA, FBI, IRS. The number one thing people are frightened of is the IRS. And that, that <laughs> basically, you know, you hear IRS, everybody gets paranoid. It's just human nature mm-hmm. uh, because you've he- heard so many horror stories. And the government loves using the IRS to make examples out of people. Mm-hmm. And they typically make the news just around tax time to put the fear of God in people to not take aggressive positions. Mm-hmm. But the point I'm going to make about that is don't let that intimidate you. If you have legitimate deductions and that they're allowed allowed under the law as a U.S. citizen and a tax paying individual, you have every legal right to take every tax deduction and credit available to you. So don't let the fear of an audit stop you. As long as you maintain the proper books and records, you have the proper documentation to back up your deductions and credits and the appropriate story to explain it. There's no reason why after going through an IRS audit, you should owe a dollar. You know, there really shouldn't be any Mm -hmm. reason at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there have been a few cases that I've been involved with, returns prepared by other advisors. We've gotten through an audit and actually got the client back more money, believe it or not. Wow. So the IRS, (laughs) their, their mission is to get money from you. But if you find errors during that audit to the client's favor, you could end up getting money back, which would be a pleasant, pleasant experience. So as long as you're following the rules of the law, don't let the IRS uh, or the threat of an IRS audit, you know, stop you from doing what you're legally entitled to do. Mm -hmm. And that is paying no more tax than the law requires. That's great advice. So that should hopefully put some people at ease. And I think the thing is, is document, document, make sure you have communication with your CPA and trusted advisor regarding 
your overall approach to taxes and uh, the ability to defend in, in the case of an audit and keep those documents for the appropriate amount of time. And then just don't panic when that happens and contact your advisor and provide what's needed only. Uh, and you shouldn't have anything really too much to worry about if you haven't done anything egregious. <laughs> Sounds like is the case, right? Absolutely correct. Great. Um, so well, with that, I'm going to wrap up today's episode uh, focusing on taxes for the dental practice. As we said, we're going to have two additional episodes, one talking about practice ownership, and dental practice ownership, and the tax implications therein, as well as the third episode will be about retirement uh, and and specifically for the dentist and, and things to consider from a tax perspective. I uh, really appreciate taking the time, John. And if you actually, John's going to be speaking. If you ever want to see John in person lecture or meet him, um, you can stop by. The, it's going to be at the Greater New York Dental Meeting this uh, November in New York City. So you want to clarify that, which is which exact date? Sure. So uh, November 24th, we're going to be doing uh, 10 characteristics of multimillionaire dentists. That's going to focus on chapter one through 10 of my book. Okay. Uh, and then also Wednesday, November 29th, I'm going to repeat that in an afternoon session. Got it. Okay. Then we have November 29th as well. That's going to be the morning session. There I'm going to be talking about creating a financially successful dental practice. Uh, included in that presentation uh, will be some of the things we're talking about throughout the three podcasts, mm -hmm. but we're going to cover a lot more territory there because we have a lot more time uh, in terms of those lectures. Great. And they can go to the... Um... Greater New York uh, Dental website. It, I'll put it in the show notes as well, but it's uh, www.gnydm.com, Greater New York Dental Meeting. Appreciate you providing that. And if anybody's in the area or would like to go hear John speak, those will, uh, those will be great opportunities to do it. So, well, thank you so much. Uh, again, I really, really appreciate it. You're a wealth of knowledge on this stuff. And I know I've learned a lot from you over our 11 years working together. And and I really wanted the opportunity to share that with the listeners and, and I'm confident they're going to come away from this episode a, a lot more highly educated and aware of a lot of, a lot of great advice that you provided. So thank you so much for taking the time. And I look forward to the next two episodes uh, that we will be able to, uh, to bring to, to the listeners. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate you uh, asking me to do this and uh, uh, hopefully you read your listeners got at least one or two great strategies out of this. The, the whole plan here, at least from my end, is helping them put a little more money in their pocket. And uh, hopefully that uh, turns out to be exactly what they're going to get out of this lecture. Absolutely. I appreciate it. I'm confident that, uh, that we'll have that desired effect for sure. So thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode of the Doc Podcast. Have a great day. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to CE courses or schedule a private one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. And remember to join the doc community on Locals for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Locals and search for the doc community. You can also find doc on Instagram at at theorthocoach. And remember, you have the power to do amazing things. Mm -hmm.